Okay, we can get started. Uh, this is the February 18th, 2003 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. Uh, on the agenda this evening, uh, we will first review and approve the minutes of the previous meeting, identify correspondence. Uh, then we will hear the Leighton Farm subdivision uh, request for preliminary subdivision review. The Ocean House Child Development Center request to expand the uh, number of children, and then the Hamlin Street Resource Protection Permit uh, request. So, um, first issue being the minutes of the previous meeting of January 21st, 2003. Move that the minutes be approved. Have a motion. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Okay, the minutes are approved. Um, identifying correspondence that we have received. Uh, a letter from Catherine Howe regarding Leighton Farm subdivision. The issue of zoning news, January 2003. The Planning Commissioner's Journal, winter 2003. Letter from George Terrian, Relatant Farms. Letter from the town manager, Relatant Farms. And a letter from Craig and Mary Brett, Relatant Farms. Uh, moving on to our first agenda item, which is the Leighton Farm subdivision. Request of Wiley Enterprises for preliminary subdivision review. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, thank you for hearing us tonight. Uh, my name is Owens McCullum, a civil engineer with the firm of Sebago Technics here tonight on behalf of uh, Wiley Enterprises, LLC. With me tonight is Joel Fitzpatrick and Kelly Fitzpatrick, um, who are the owners and would be glad to answer any questions the board may have. When we were last before the board, we were here for a completeness review, uh, at which time we made a presentation on the, the project and the board granted uh, completeness for the project. Uh, there was a subsequent site walk uh, uh, that Joel attended. I was unable to attend that. I honestly don't know who all attended the meeting, but uh, Joel uh, met the folks who were able to walk and, uh, to take a look at the site. Uh, tonight we're here for a continuation um, of the review of this project. Uh, this would be for the public hearing tonight, and then hopefully after this process we would move on to a preliminary plan review and hopefully approval. Um, in between our last meeting and this one, we have made a supplemental plan submitted, which I believe is uh, uh, before you tonight. Uh, mostly of what is in that is uh, cleaning up some details that were in... Oh, speak up. Uh, mostly what was in that supplemental submittal were... Uh, details, uh, additional information that were based on the town engineer's review. Uh, I wrote a letter of January 31st which summarizes those changes to the plan. They included clarification on the monumentation and the right-of-way, uh, some slight modifications to the existing farm pond. Um, we also included um, an adjustment in the uh, road design for increasing the uh, width of the esplanade before we had like, four, I think it was a four foot wide esplanade. We widened it as much as we could, pushing the sidewalk to the right of way line. We also moved the street trees into that esplanade. Uh, there were a couple of other minor details uh, that we adjusted uh, in regard to the fire hydrant location. The fire chief had requested that we move that fire hydrant location, which we have. Um, 
One of the other items OST uh, asked was that we separate the grading and the utilities plans so that it was easier to read, which we did do. We agreed with that. Uh, that made a lot of sense. We did make that change to the plans. Uh, some of the other ones dealt with uh, notes at, um, regarding details, types of pipes, uh, had to deal with some utilities. Uh, we also, since the last meeting, uh, Joel has gone to the council for uh, conditional municipal acceptance of the uh, open space, the roads uh, for the sewer infrastructure. Uh, Michael McGovern prepared a letter to the board which was referenced in the correspondence. We've gone through that process. Uh, we've also received a letter from the Portland Water District. We asked their review of the sanitary pump station, which we have received a letter from, if you uh, recall, we were going to take the sanitary waste from this project and tie into uh, the town infrastructure, which is now part of the uh, Cross Hill subdivision that went down to a pump station uh, down on the Wells Road in this vicinity. And one of the questions was to ensure that there was capacity within that pump station to handle the flow from this project. The water district looked at that. They looked at the flow data. Uh, they took our projections of flow. And they've written, since written a letter that said the capacity is there to take the flow from our project. And I think that covers the bulk of the, uh, the changes to the plans. Again, if uh, the process tonight uh, we hope to go through is get some input back from the public and then move forward towards the preliminary plan review. If the board has questions that uh, uh, they would like me to address, I can do that now. Um, I held my uh, presentation to the changes to the plan. If it seemed appropriate, I'd be glad to go back over more of the details of the project. Uh, but I'll leave that to the discretion of the board. Well, why don't we open the public hearing and then we can come back. You can address uh, questions. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to open the public hearing on this project. I would ask anyone that would like to speak to approach the microphone, um, identify yourselves, and indicate uh, where you live. Good evening. I'm Robert Howe, and um, I live at 9 Steeplebush Road. Um, I want to address this as a citizen, but also as um, somebody who, who has been before planning boards and have been doing this type of thing for almost 30 years. Um, and with that knowledge and experience, um, also with the training I have, um, I just want to lend some um, professional opinion as well as personal opinion to separate the two is a little awkward, but as a neighbor, I feel like I need to respond. Um, there's, um, you should have two letters from us in your file. If you do not, um, please make sure you have them both. Do you have them? Thank you. Yeah. Yes, we have two letters. Okay. Um, there's a few things that uh, first strike us about this uh, this property, and and you walk the site, so you know that it's quite high, um, uh, reaches uh, some of the highest uh, elevations in town. Also, would offer a tremendous view views from that location. Certainly, selling points. Um, but we have a little problem the way it's been assembled. Um, and we're not sure that the ordinance, I'm sure the ordinance may allow it, but it seems to us, and I think I use the, we use the term disingenuous about the way it's been cobbled together. This is a, a piece of land that uh, has been made to work because the applicant has been able to borrow or, or uh, gather together other parcels around that are of a questionable value than offer it to the town as if it's something of greater value. And indeed, that parcel that's being offered is already in an easement, so the easement to offer an easement seems also awkward to us. 
so much of that property to the north and east is in the under the CMP easement already. Um, we are also concerned with the notion of working on this hillside and its impression. These are relatively small lots. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, there is a great deal of interest and certainly the um, planning efforts, professional planners are certainly very interested in, in proper stewardship and creating the type of sizes of lots that somehow hearken to uh, another day and probably a certain efficiency um, of use. But here we have, in my opinion, a swath that's going to be look like Levittown as you drive up the road. The lots are small enough that virtually all the trees from each lot will have to come off, if not because for the house, but certainly because of blasting. And the hillside will essentially be a uh, a rather raw knob when it's done um, with these size lots. The land is of little value for anything perhaps other than building. It's certainly not agricultural land. Um, but with the amount of blasting and gymnastics you need to go through to make this site work, it's an awkward and I think would be an, will be an unattractive swath or wound on the hillside. Um, there are some other concerns we have about, um, uh, maybe we can ask the question at this point. We're curious because we know at the outset back in August at a workshop um, that there was talk about the land across the street. We'd like to know what's going on with that. Uh, is that part of this parcel and is there any, I haven't seen any reference to it, so I have to assume that um, it's, it's not part of the effort. Um, when one of our letters we asked for that flow data, um, I haven't received anything. We'd like to take a look at it um, if we could. And that brings up the point of <clears throat> the sewer crossing um, into Cross Hill. Um, there's nothing wrong with using that easement, certainly. Uh, some of our neighbors are not here tonight, not only because of wet inclement weather, weather, but because of the time of the year, the vacation period. So um, I can speak for some of their concerns um, with the crossing of a sewer line down the easement and the effects in that neighborhood of having to blast for that route. The blasting takes it very close to two homes. Um, stipulations in the state law requires blasters to carry a certain amount of insurance to, do and to notify the blasters and to do pre-blasting surveys and we would hope that is adhered to um, should this go forward. Um, but it's quite close. We already know that some of the houses, and because of uh, Cross Hill's uh, rather tight knit uh, lot, also that some of the houses have, you you certainly can feel the rumbling and the uh, uh, effects of blasting, and there have been occasional mishaps. Um, so we would like to make sure that doesn't happen in an area that's extremely close to both buildings, to two two homes that is. Um, we'd also like to see, um, rather than further removal of trees in the area, some preservation and reclamation of, of the property over that easement. I think in summary, we're concerned about this enough to voice our opinions that we're obviously um, discomforted by the, the appearance that this will have. I understand this is to be built in a growth development area in Cape, according to the master plan, but I don't think the master plan also anticipated the type of effect that this, these small lots and multiple lots uh, will have. 
the developer has done a, a good job over an Abaco drive um, in some regard. Um, and I know reference has been made to that project with this one. Large houses, small lots. I don't understand quite how it's the same or should be analogous to this site. Um, that was already a pre-approved subdivision. Um, certainly uh, the state planning office is uh, very interested in seeing that type of development go on and in the right place and mix for those types of developments were also a product of their times. And I would hate to see that this is being replicated because we're somehow romantically involved with um, a past experience that may or may not be applicable. I know we, fi we find it, I find it strange in Cross Hill we have sidewalks. We need it. The roads are nice and narrow, and that's good. But the sidewalks don't go anywhere. We get down to Wells Road, and now we're from a safe street environment onto a high speed, or, or onto Spurwink, a high, high speed road. And so we walk there to endanger ourselves. Um, the notion that somehow we're trying to create these kind of small, intimate town like, or uh, harken back to a, um, uh, the great American neighborhood notion in these remote, isolated locations around town just doesn't fly. Not to replicate this type of development where we have tight lots and sidewalks and things, you need a certain mass and center, uh, a certain critical mass of not services, uh, other buildings, uh, really you need that to support what the effort is for the development. Just to kind of drop that in on a site without regard to the overall scheme of how uh, um, either the town or the region or the local uh, development is going is really quite awkward. Um, I would encourage also when you review that, you, uh, of course you know Cross Hill very well, those of us who live in that area are very pleased with it. We share um, several, uh, a couple hundred acres of property. Um, in there where we're, a lot of us uh, um, share some open space. Um, uh, lots are close together, side to side, cheek to chowl in many cases, but they all have a common, out, common kind of theme where we do have open space. Um, there are microclimates created by stands of trees, um, wind buffers, um, those type of features. And I will close by saying I don't think, from what I've seen here, that this development achieves that type, those types of amenities, those types of um, benefits for anyone. Um, thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Uh, hello, my name is Cindy Collins and I live at 8 Steeplebush Road. And uh, I'm certainly not a public speaker. I'm a school teacher and I talk to six year old faces. So for me to come up here, I plan my speech all day long because I was snowed in. And I'm not really sure how it's going to come out, but I have a couple of points I'd like to make. Um, first, I've been a resident. I live in um, Cross Hills. I live at 8 Steeplebush Road, which is right across from the um, line that will be coming down to put the sewer in. Uh, but I've been a resident of uh, Cape Elizabeth for 20 years. I've had three children graduate from the school. I love this town, and I love the beauty of this town. I know when I first moved here 20 years ago, I moved here from Wichita, Kansas, and I could not believe the beauty of this state. Um, the first fall I was here, I was packing red and gold and yellow leaves into envelopes and sending them home to my family, and when they came out, they said the same thing. They just could not believe it, and most of it was in the trees. Now, I know I live in Cross Hills, and a lot of trees have come down to make that property, but also I feel that it's been done in good taste, or I wouldn't want to... 
I, I wouldn't have wanted to move there. When I look outside, I see trees on both sides. I see trees behind me. And if it had to be, it had to be. And um, it was done in good taste. And I, my first thing is I'm asking that the new development, which I realize I have no chance of stopping being put in, I hope it's done in good taste too. And it's not just one house. I know out in Wichita, Kansas, they have no trees, and the houses are put in one right after another, as close as they can be, and it's really not pretty. And when I came out here, I thought, this is absolutely gorgeous, these, these neighborhoods. And I hope we all realize what we have here, and I think you as a, um, the town and as the planning board have a tremendous responsibility to help us hold on to that, because once this development, Cross Hills was put in, once this development is done, um, another one will come, and another one, and another one. And sometimes when I drive through Scarborough, not that I don't have many friends there and their homes are beautiful, but I think, wow, this is beginning to look like Wichita, Kansas. One house right on top of another. Where have all the trees gone in the 20 years I've been here? So that's my first thing I'm asking, that um, when the development is put in, please make sure that the open land is open land that adds to the beauty of our town and not just a strip of green grass that can be considered part of the 40%. The next thing I'm asking is that we do live on the cul-de-sac, eight steeple bush. The strip of land on lot number, let's see, well, I'm right across from it. I'm, li I'm right in here. And the, the, lot, um, the line would be right in front of my home where they take down all the mature trees. Now, I know Joel Patrick has promised us, and I hope he does, that he will um, put other trees in there once he pulls down all these large mat mature trees. But once those big trees are gone, they're gone. And they're not coming back for me in my lifetime or you or my children's or his little um, baby that he's named his property, Little Wiley, they aren't going to see these large mature trees that we've got here in this state. And every time we pull one down, I think we ought to really stop and think about the responsibility we have. And, and you're the ones that have that responsibility to help us plan that. And Joel certainly has the responsibility as someone who lives in our town and realizes we have probably one of the most beautiful places in the United States, I feel, to live. And let's not ruin it by just putting in house after house after house every time someone decides to sell some land and uh, a developer comes in and decides to build. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Sure. My name is Larry Collins, and I own the property at uh, 8 Steeple Bush. And I'd like to ask the, uh, the planning board to seriously consider the use of the utility easement uh, into uh, the Cross Hill development at Steeple Bush uh, for the sewer run. Uh, I think this proposed de development, I'm sure, and, and I'm not uh, an expert in this uh, area, but uh, meets the uh, requirements of all the zoning regulations, uh, but I think we've been uh, very imaginative and, and dotting our I's and crossing our T's uh, by the use of the open space uh, that certainly my children have been using in that power line area for, for the decades that we've been here. Uh, it is already open space. Uh, the, the uh, reality is that we have a fairly high density subdivision going in. Uh, for years, I've been walking those power lines with my dog and, and uh, children. Uh, but I'm sure technically it meets the requirements. Uh, and what we're proposing to do by using the utility easement onto Steeple Bush is to take a small area of mature growth trees and blast the living daylights out of it, strip it down, throw some grass, and as my wife said, in 50 years, there may be some trees there again. Uh, I, I think it's an unnecessary 
and uh, given the proximity to the existing homes, uh, high risk uh, that we don't need uh, to, uh, that we shouldn't have to, uh, to uh, consider. I think that uh, it would be much simpler, uh, not a significant added cost. Uh, I've heard the estimates, and it's about 1 or 2 percent of the price of a house in this development uh, to run the sewer line down the proposed uh, Layton uh, Farm Road uh, and hook on to uh, Wells Road, rather than to uh, take this fairly high-density uh, subdivision and further intrude on the Cross Hill uh, development, which was done under a significantly different uh, set of standards. Uh, significantly more open space in Cross Hills than on this street. Uh, and I think uh, Cross Hills uh, made a point of when you drive down the street, most, most of all the streets in Cross Hill, you do see open space and there, there are trees. Uh, when you drive down Steeple Bush Road, which is probably about the same length of this, I think there's, what, 10 lots on Steeple Bush and we're talking 16 or 17 here. Uh, and when you drive down Steeple Bush Road, you don't get the feeling that it's house after house after house. You get the feeling that, yes, this is Cape Elizabeth, this is Maine. And it's, it's uh, uh, comfortable go out and walk, walk through the woods, snowshoe, cross-country ski, walk the dog. Uh, but it's a much more, much more pleasant uh, environment uh, than this street will be. Again, most of the open space in this development is back there. You're not going to see that. When you drive in down, down here, excuse me, but when you drive in the road, you won't see the open space. That open space is going to be hid behind, behind homes. That open space is there today and is used today by many different people. I walk those trails almost every day with my, my dog, and I constantly come across at least two or three other parties walking those same trails. They're heavily used all year round, even, even in the winter and the snow. Uh, I've been meeting people out there and, and seeing uh, uh, paths. Uh, so I think that to, to uh, you know, the, de the development should go in. I'm not opposed to growth. Uh, certainly Cape Elizabeth needs to grow and, and needs to expand its tax, tax base. Uh, but we shouldn't intrude on the other neighborhoods that are existing when there are reasonably affordable alternatives uh, available to us. The estimates, again, the estimates are, are very small on a per lot basis, given that there are so many lots in that uh, street. It's extremely uh, affordable to run the, the uh, sewer access, or whatever you call it, uh, down, the, down the road, rather than to intrude on uh, the Cross Hill and also run the high risk of blasting near existing homes. Uh, the neighborhood on Steeple Bush is uh, not completely done, but the homes there are settled in. The landscaping is done. The, the growth is back. Uh, it is es essentially a completed neighborhood with the exception of the cul-de-sac area. Uh, but now we're talking about starting over again and blasting it out in fairly uh, close proximity to uh, existing homes. And yes, there have been foundations damaged in Cross Hill from blasting at distances far greater than what we're proposing here. So I ask the board to, uh, to consider that very seriously, uh, given, the, given the leeway that we have given the subdivision and accepting the uh, the, uh, the open space that's, that's been open for as long as I live in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Close the public hearing. Um, I'd like to have the applicant again maybe to address some of the issues and the board's questions. Thank you. Um, to, to start with, I guess I'll, I'll go back to the layout and the design of the development. Um, this is uh, situated in the growth zone. 
the lot sizes, the density, the development is all built around the zoning, what's allowed within that, within that growth zone. The lots themselves, uh, the smallest lot is approximately 10,000 square feet, which is down here, and that would be in the area where the affordable housing would go. The biggest lot goes all the way up to almost 17,000 square feet in size. Uh, just for comparison, the Hemlock Hill subdivision, the lot sizes were 10,000 square feet. So many of these lots are one and a half times, if not one and a half times or more in size than, than the Hemlock Hill subdivision. The applicant has made reference to that because um, he's always approached each of these developments as individual developments. He develops the roads, the lots, builds the houses in them, and Joel has always approached it to build the houses and the roads to the land. And he's been pretty proud over the years of what he did with the Hemlock Hill, and that was just as an example of how he approaches the projects. Uh, so that was the intent on that. Um, in regard to open space, I know that Joel uh, included in your packets, and I'll, I guess I'll try to hold this up, um, an outline of the open space around the project and in the vicinity. And what he did was he took a cutout and showed the subdivision here. And as I said at the last meeting, the whole goal is to continue, is to develop a continuation of the open space. Um, as far as the CMP easement goes, um, that was not included in our calculations for open space. It is, it is an open space, but when we calculate our open space and our lot densities, we cannot take credit for that area in the CMP easement. So I think it's important to, to make that distinction. Again, the whole concept was, as I said earlier, was the farmhouse. Joel's goal is to keep the farmhouse here, renovate it, if you notice, we placed open space around the farmhouse to give that actually the sense of a larger um, lot, a larger area as you come in the road. Um, that farmhouse has been there for a long time. Joel felt that it gave it um, its own definition of an entrance and wanted to have that there. So the whole approach to the project was to develop the parcel in a manner that worked with the land, worked with the development approach that he's taken with other projects, and he really does work to build to the land. It's a beautiful piece of land. Uh, yes, there will be trees cleared on individual lots. Since Joel is the developer, he's always taken care to try to preserve what he can for trees and vegetation in the lots. Um, he's tried to build houses that fit with those lots and work with the land. Um, a question came up about the land across the street. Uh, the applicant does uh, retain ownership of land across the street that goes down to the marsh. That is not part of this development. Um, we're not uh, having that at all in any way part of this development. I think when, uh, many months ago when we came in at a, con at a workshop level, we showed that piece of land across the street. The applicant was exploring some options but has since pulled that out of any of the development at this time. So just for clarification on that. Uh, in regard to the sewer, uh, the applicant actually did look at one option of bringing the sewer down to here, putting in a pump station, down there another pump station, and then uh, pumping into this force main up to the gravity. Uh, we actually talked with the water district because that was an option that we looked at. Uh, the water district prefers not to have uh, more pump stations or more infrastructure that they have to maintain and take care of. Uh, their preference is to uh, consolidate the infrastructure um, and that's what had us looking at the capacity of the pump station at the Cross Hill. If you, uh, back in my earlier submission, um, it was indicated that that pump station had additional capacity, I think, for uh, 150 gallons per minute. And uh, what we did was we spoke with the actual design engineer that designed that pump station, Les Barry of BH2M, asked him to write a letter and then actually went on to the water district and they did their own independent analysis of what, how that station is functioning. And then that generated the letter from the water district. So there's been quite a bit of work 
done around that uh, pump station to make sure it does have the capacity, and it does. And also looking at the best option to sewer this project. So we did look at this, but that would have required an additional pump station. Uh, this allowed for gravity flow um, over into the Cross Hill uh, sewer system that comes down uh, to this pump station. There are these lots here, because they are lower, will have individual pump systems at their houses that pumps up to the, where this gravity collects for the rest of the development. Those pump systems are, will be identical to the pump systems that are in many of the Cross Hill homes uh, in some areas of that development. They're called an E1 system. They're a, um, a prefab pump set, set up that goes inside the houses or just outside the houses. Uh, in regard to uh, the easement across the, uh, the utility easement or right-of-way that we would be bringing the sewer across, uh, one thing we did do as we went back out into the field and located um, the tree limits, uh, did a topographical survey, located some of the houses and improvements in that area, and then we took the sewer design and worked the sewer design to do a best fit uh, in there so that we could try to retain what we can for vegetation. Now, when you bring a sewer through, there will, they do have to clear to bring that sewer through. We'll clear an area probably 30 feet in width. Um, our goal is to try to retain some trees on the upper hill side and also do some supplemental planting on the lower, on the lower side. And, some, and that is depicted on the plans. So we do plan to do some uh, additional planting. How, how wide is the right of way? The right of way is 50 feet. Um, it will also most likely require some blasting. That is true. Um, and some of the foundations on the lots may require blasting. Um, as with any blasting operation, um, there is insurances, there's pre-blast surveys. All of that protocol will be followed just like any other blasting project. Joel has had that on some of the projects he's worked with. Uh, very careful on that. And again, the goal is not to devastate the land because Joel's trying to market this land. It's in the types of houses, the market that he's aiming for. Um, he has to build a project conducive to that. I, th I think I touched on the highlight items, so we'll be glad to answer any questions. Joel is here himself to um, try to answer any questions the board may have. Questions? Anyone? One of the issues raised in the town planner's uh, memorandum of February 18th was that the stormwater uh, plan, or the final engineering for that plan, was still ongoing. What's the status of that now? Uh, yes, we are working with OST Associates, uh, working through that. Primarily, uh, what we're looking at is the light and pond down here, uh, integrating that in with our stormwater and cross hills, and then where this pond discharges, it goes through a culvert at the Wells Road, and we were just wanting to make sure that that culvert is adequately sized for the combined drainage from both developments. And so we've had a couple, we've had a meeting with um, the town engineer and the town, well, and the public works director, Bob Malley. Uh, Maureen attended that, and we talked through those, those items that we were trying to address. The town engineer asked us to do some supplemental analysis, which is ongoing and we will provide them with the results on that. And essentially, it's looking at what exactly we're going to do with that pond, and uh, if anything, what we would have to do with this call for crossing. Some discussion, too, has been, would Joel be willing to give an easement to the town for drainage across this land since it goes down to the marsh, uh, just to, to have an easement for drainage to make sure that there's always a way for that drainage to get down there, and he is willing to do that. So those have been the essence of the discussions. You're welcome. All 
Since you're talking about that parcel or that piece of land with the runoff, uh, have you started the DEP review yet? Or no, uh, we will be filing a stormwater permit with the DEP, but typically we don't file those applications until we receive a preliminary plan approval. And the reason for that is, is once we start into the DEP process, um, we don't like to make changes uh, a whole, you know, we'd like to know that we're proceeding with the appropriate design, the appropriate concept. And then once we would have a preliminary plan approval, we'll file <coughs> that with the DEP. And then uh, we would come back to the planning board once we work through that process, which should be 30 to 60 days. Andy? I have a couple questions sure. about the open space and pedestrian access. Could you, with your finger, just show where the access points are for the public on the set of plans that we received? Okay. To the green, to the green areas? Um, one would be through this, the uh, utility easement that comes across the Cross Hill. This will provide a link between the two developments. Also, uh, the trail would come through here, come up to connect. As uh, Mr. Howe indicated, there's a trail system along the Central Main uh, Power Company easement that would connect into that. The applicant is also proposing to construct some additional trails in this area. Um, the goal is, the, you know, part of this whole open space is it does get it a little bit closer to the Jordan Pond. Joel actually asked if he could purchase land all the way up to the Mr. Jordan is reluctant to do that at this time. And following up on that, um, there's some discussion at the site walk about possibly having other access points. And I was wondering if you all got any further uh, plans or ideas on that in discussions with the Conservation Commission. I know we're expecting to have some formal input from them <coughs> shortly. I think I'll let Joel answer that because he was actually in that conservation. Okay. Hey, my name is Patrick, uh, owner of the property. Uh, a week or so ago, we met with the Conservation Committee, uh, and they spoke of locations of trails. Uh, they actually would like to see one start at this little road. Uh, that's already there that comes along the pond and goes up the side. They're also thinking maybe one along this, this side. Uh, I thought we might get a letter by now uh, from the Conservation Commission Committee uh, on the input of that meeting, uh, but I haven't seen it as of today. Uh, they also talked about, uh, uh, they, they did like the idea that one of the trails would be actually on one of the highest points in town uh, with some views, which is in this area right here. This property is actually really beautiful land and it connects with the rest of the open space in Cross Hill. So if they could build a trail that comes up along the highest point and back around, they were thinking of uh, maybe uh, having me, they asked if I'd be willing to put a little bench up there or something. And we, I think we can do something like that up in here. So basically to answer your question, they would like an access uh, here at the easement uh, here uh, and possibly one here. So would you anticipate adding something like that to the next set of plans that we receive? Yes, we were just waiting for their input. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'm very sympathetic to the views uh, expressed by the residents of Cross Hill about the compactness of the site. And it does meet planning code, certainly. However, um, the houses are going to be reasonably good size and close together. Will there be any plan to put, there isn't a lot of room, but put some landscaping on the lots, trees and things like that, after the homes are built? to try to minimize the look of one house on top of the other? I think that's your question. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a good question. Uh, most of the homes in this price range, uh, and also I am going to be the only builder, so I have a little more control than most, but there will be some uh, covenants uh, written up that a certain amount of landscaping has to be planted within the first year. Uh, 
in the covenants of the subdivision. Uh, when we design these homes, uh, we design them for compact lots. Um, if you go in a place like Stone, uh, a Stonegate, for instance, you see some big colonials with big mudrooms, big garages, and they're like 100 feet long. You can't do that on this type of lot. So we've got to design these, these homes to fit the, the setbacks. Uh, for example, on, lot, uh, on my Hemlock Hill property, there were 10 foot setbacks. These are 25 foot setbacks. Uh, so there's 50 feet in between each home, in, in between each setback. Uh, so we will be designing them to fit the lots and making sure people do their landscaping. And my point at the beginning was that from my experience here in town and, uh, and houses and homes in this price range, that's the first thing people do is put lots of money into the landscaping. Uh, as far as trees and buffers, and everybody wants a buffer. Uh, not just the abutters, but the people going to be moving here also are very interested in privacy and buffering. Um, does, does that help answer the question? Well, I know you can put things in covenants. I also know that people don't always right. pay attention to the covenants, and then they're very hard to enforce afterwards. We live in an area with covenants, too. And, and I'm wondering if you might not consider perhaps including some landscaping for which people would have to pay, obviously, in the price of the home, but as part of it, so that, again, there was a little bit more control about perhaps... The, the, you are right about covenants and, and hard, having a hard time controlling them, but within the first year, within the first 12 months, the covenants will, will state that something has to be done. A lot of times you can't do it, you can't do any plantings because you finish the home in December, say, and you can't plant anything until, you know, April or May, June. So uh, you gotta, you got to give at least a year for, to let people uh, figure out what they want to do. Um, but like I said, they're, uh, if you go into Cross Hill, I believe their setbacks are 20 feet. And people are you know, we were we were I, I built uh, probably 15 to 20 homes in Cross Hill, and we tried to save as many trees as we could, uh, and we were able to. And I think this 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 site will be able to save a few on, on, along the sidelines also. We have 10 feet more here than than we did at Cross Hill. Most most of the people I built for in Cross Hill they they wanted to clear right to right to the lot line. Can I follow up on that? Sure. I'm a little confused by this 12-month um, situation. Are you saying that as the developer, you're going to come in there, say, if you finish a home in December, and as part of the purchase price, the owner's going to have that landscaping done by you at the appropriate time of year? Or are you saying that the owner is going to have to, on their additional nickel, com complete some level of uh, landscaping under the covenants within that year, within the planting time frame you just talked about. I'm just confused. It's going to be both. Okay. It all depends on the contract I have with my customers. You, usually we have a landscape budget right. in the cons contra construction contract. Sometimes people don't want that because of financing or they want to do it themselves later, mm -hmm. at a later date. So they will do a lot of their landscaping themselves, personally, or at a later date when my contract is all said and done, they will, they will do, do it on their own. When do you expect that you'll have some kind of draft of those covenants that you're talking about? I have a draft already in your packet. Okay. Um, so beyond that, is, you, you said that there were covenants. Those are the covenants you're talking about. Those are the covenants I'm talking about. I, you, the, I think right now... I, <coughs> From going by memory on my covenants, it's covenants is six hundred dollars allowed for for plantings. I can't up that. You can't. I can't. Oh, you can't. Yeah, I just did what Cross Hill did. Actually, they did the same thing. In Hemlock Hill, I didn't do anything like that. Mm -hmm. and if you ride down Hemlock Hill, people have put 40, 40 inches, anywhere from twenty to thirty thousand dollars into their landscaping after I get it home. So I really don't have to worry about that. Uh, well, there's two, like I said, people in this price range usually want their outsides of their homes to look good. So. But here we're talking about against existing homes versus the intra-project homes, which I think you're right. People will take care of on their own. Uh, I think our concern at this point was probably more 
the abutting development, not well, in this development. The abutting, I, I can't touch anything in this whole swath anyway. Sure. They've, you know, the people in the back here in Cross Hill are going to have a minimum of 60 feet of trees that I can't touch okay. unless it's dead or diseased or falling down. So that, uh, you know, I, I don't, that, there's going to be some, uh, you know, there's going to be some existing trees staying there. Besides, uh, it's hard just because of the blasting and the equipment has to get around. Most, most of the time, you try to save an existing tree sure. as an ugly tree or existing bush or whatever. It's just a stop, tall, spindly thing that want, people want to cut down anyway. They want to plant something new. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to make a couple of comments and ask a couple of questions. Um, the one area that I that I see is, is is going to create a bit of a problem, and I know you've done projects in town and done a great job at them, and I know you will on this, but this sewer connection is a, a serious concern, um, and I can see why you've decided to do it the way you have. Um, I just would like that one ask if you would possibly put on your next submission or on your drawings what kind of vegetation you plan to put there, make a choice now, and that would give the residents in Cross Hill, I think, a little more comfort that, that um, you will keep the right. buffer there. And I know you talked about it in the site walk, and I know you'll do it, but I'm just wondering if you might put it on your plans. I think the revised plans <coughs> do have something. It has... It does identify vegetation, but I'm not sure that it identifies the type of vegetation. There's 11 firs, 10 to 12 foot balsam firs that are... They are looking at it. I could probably help with that. Uh, when I laid out the sewer through that easement, um, I actually did a clearing envelope and then did a finished grading contour so I would know, you know, what would be the extent of, of grading in that area to bring the sewer through. And um, it became clear to me that on the upper hill side, uh, there was an opportunity to save about a 15-foot um, swath of, of, of trees on the upper, on the uphill side. The driveway on the lower side, the uh, Brett parcel, if I got that right, um, is has a driveway that comes up very close. And I'm looking probably the best thing is like a sheet of tree and bait. That's probably the best thing. Along that downhill parcel, the driveway um, of that downhill parcel comes almost right up to the easement line. And after I laid the sewer in through there, it became clear that that vegetation through there was going to be removed. So I talked to Joel, and I said, I think we need to uh, plant some sort of evergreen buffer in through there. And it was suggested that we do some sort of a fir uh, type vegetation. So uh, that's how we got to that, that layout uh, through there. And what we did was we went... Um, put those firs basically along that driveway to where it ended in the back. Back by the back of the house and then went a little bit beyond that to, to create a buffer along that piece right there. But it became clear that we, we felt that was going to end up cleared right to the property line, which, and their driveway was right to the property line, so um, it seemed appropriate to do some planning along that edge. We did the site walk and we went up there. <coughs> I don't remember seeing too much vegetation, so if you put something back there, it's going to yeah. it's going to make it a lot nicer. Just so that I understand, your sewer line is going to be closer to that driveway than it is to the other side of the right away. That's correct. There would seem to be quite a bit of a ledge in there. I, I'm sorry, I, I was looking at the plan. Yes. Is your sewer line going to be closer as you walk, as you go from Layton 
over to Cross Hill. Is the sewer line going to hug the right side, or is it going to be in the center, or is it going to be? It will be closer point? to the, as you're coming from Layton, it will be closer to the left-hand okay. side, the downhill side. So um, until you get to the very last, once you get to the very last manhole, it, it almost goes right down the center because I have to tie into the, yep. the sewer over there um, in, at Steeple Bush Road. So there is a possibility of that vegetation on the right not surviving? We think so. Um, uh, you know, we actually graded it up. I figured a 30-foot cleared area through there, and that's sort of why we pushed it over. Um, a couple other comments. I, I may be wrong, but I think the correspondence that we have on this project or any project is open for the public to review. So if there's any questions that you might have on any of the correspondence that we've received, I think you can get access to look at it in the planning office. Um, I, it may be a personal <laughs> fetish for me, but uh, sidewalks, I think, are a welcome addition in town. And I'm pleased that you have put them in your project. I know the town engineer um, with a Highway Department was hoping you wouldn't put them in, but I think it's a great addition, and I commend you on the vegetation that you've laid out for it. That's all my comments. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Regarding the, the connection to the sewer pipe through the town-owned right-of-way, um, I also sympathize with the folks who are particularly the abutters to that right-of-way. Um, I think it's fortunate that this development, as proposed, does have a buffer, that green strip, between Leighton Farms and Cross Hill, because in Cross Hill, many of the lots have been cleared right up to the property line. So were that green strip right not there, we could actually have uh, no, you know, no mandated buffer at all. Um, and part of the reason why I'm sure why there's concern about the trees in the right-of-way is because those are some of the only trees left, since a lot of trees were cleared when those lots were developed. But I think it would, it would definitely help me and maybe some members of the board if Maureen could kind of review for us how that right-of-way came to be and why it's there. Uh, in the town subdivision ordinance for many, many years, there is a requirement that uh, when new subdivisions are developed, that there would be a stub for new road right-of-ways to abutting undeveloped land. So when Cross Hill was designed, um, it was a requirement of the planning board that a stub be provided for a new road connection into the abutting Leighton parcel and the abutting Jordan parcel. So if you look at the, the, this particular 50-foot strip was actually set aside as a road right-of-way. And there is a second one in the, on the north of it off of Tiger Lily Lane that is also set aside to connect to the Jordan land as a 50-foot wide road right-of-way that the town has a deed to. So it could have been that this was an actual road and not just a, a sewer connection which is then revegetated. In, in fact, yes, we discussed that with, with the developer and, and he uh, did not want to put a road in there for a lot of reasons, uh, but that was an original uh, discussion that we had. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, I know that you're going to build one affordable housing unit for lower income people. And I'm wondering if it wouldn't be possible for you to designate the potential lots right on the plans. Yes, you will see them on, on the next uh, revised plan. Thank you. I have one other question of uh, Owen. Um, regarding the letter that uh, Steve Harding wrote on February 10th, mm -hmm. um, item number seven, um, I'm not sure whether you addressed that this evening, but would you clarify some of those questions that he had? Sure. Is that something you can do tonight? Or? Let me... Uh... Um, 
that that comment which uh, dealt with slopes and inverts and the information around the Leighton Farms pond uh, was in part one of the reasons we had the meetings. We were looking at all that drainage, how it all comes together. Uh, Bob Malley had some questions. Uh, frankly, we had some questions because our goal is to preserve that pond intact as best we can and accommodate the drainage from uh, uh, that's already going through there from Cross Hill. We actually went to the original design engineer and got his drainage study, and his computer model, and worked with that into ours so that we can keep that infrastructure together. And that's part of the conversations we had with Steve Harding and Bob Malley, and, and that all centers around that conversation. And we're, I think we've just about got the details worked out on it. The, I guess really one of the final discussions is is this, this culvert through here. We're in the process of running some additional uh, calculations just to see how um, high up this, the water ponds at this culvert um, to see if we think it ought to be increased in size. So that'll be clarified on the next Absolutely. Other questions, comments? Thank you, Mr. Hask. Um, well, it appears obviously there are, we will be getting another set of revised plans. There were certainly some good um, issues and concerns raised at the public hearing. Uh, so uh, I, for one, think that we should consider this at the next meeting. David? Would you like a motion? I would. Um, <coughs> A motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and the materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Wiley Enterprise LLC for major subdivision review and a resource protection permit to construct the Leighton Farms, a 16 lot subdivision located off Wells Road, be tabled to the March 18th meeting of the planning board. Thank you. Second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the Ocean House Child Development Center. Request by Lori Grant to expand the number of children at the Ocean House Child Deve Development Center from 12 to 32. Good evening. I'm Lori Grant, and this is Peggy Littlefield, and we're co-owners of the Ocean House Child Development Center, which is located in the United Methodist Church on Route 77. Um, we would like to expand our program, which right now, um, the program, we're licensed to care for children ages six weeks to five years, um, up to 12 children. We have the ability, we're licensed for that and approved for that. We'd like to expand the capacity of the program from 12 to 32 children. Um, currently, we provide care Monday through Friday, 7 to 5.30 each day, and we have a small facility child care license. We've included a packet of information um, that shows that the church has given us permission to use the space, and that's in your packet. Uh, we included a key map of the site um, and also names and addresses of owners um, of property that's around the, the, the church property. 
Um, also, we've shown in the packet the lot line dimensions. We're not proposing any new, any modifications to the buildings or any of the area. We're going to use the existing, we currently are providing care in a classroom that we're, you know, we're using right now. We'd like to just use the classroom that's right next to us. And um, in the packet, we've included a floor plan of the church that shows the classroom that we're currently using and also the adjacent classroom that we'd like to use. Um, we've also included a site map in the packet that shows the location of the building and the parking lot. We're proposing to use all the same exits and entrances to the parking lot and to the building. Um, there's a play area that's currently there that's enclosed with a fence, and um, the area of the play area is 3,384 square feet, which more than fulfills the Cape Elizabeth ordinance of 75 square feet of play yard space per child. Um, so we've also included in the packet a projected pattern of children arriving and leaving the child care center, and it shows kind of approximately over periods of time that it's pretty spread out that kids will be arriving um, in the morning and leaving in the afternoon. And we've projected about 25% of those children will be siblings and using the same car. Um, let's see. Also, in the site plan, um, we're, we're using the same lighting that's currently there. And it shows in the site plan where the lighting is located. Um, we also would like to add a sign, and I made a mistake actually the way that I wrote in there. I said that the um, sign that we're proposing to have would be affixed to the Methodist church, but I meant to the Methodist church sign that is already on the property. And we indicated on the site plan map where the sign is. And the dimensions of the sign will be 22 and a quarter inches by 27 inches. And it'll be made, it, made of um, coated exterior plywood. It won't be lighted. And um, I showed in the packet um, kind of how, what the sign will look like. And um, that sign dynamics, um, we'll be doing that if that's approved. Um, we've also included information about Peggy and I. Um, we're the current business owners and teachers in the program. And we both worked together when we owned and operated a child care center in Portland for the last six years, five, well, five years or so. And we both have um, degrees in the education field and have a lot of experience caring for children or running business. I don't know if that addresses everything or if there's any questions. Or... Well, um, the first issue we have to deal with is whether the application is complete. So first we have to decide on that. And if it is, uh, we will move on to the public hearing. But first I'd ask the board if they have any questions or comments on the issue of completeness. Anyone? I don't have any comments. I, I'd be prepared to make a motion unless anybody else has any questions. Okay. All right. I have a motion for the board to consider uh, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Lori Grant for site plan review to expand the Ocean House Child Development Center located at 280 Ocean House Road from 12 to 32 children be deemed complete. Okay. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. Um, the application is deemed complete. Uh, now we'll open the public hearing. And I would ask any members of the public that would like to address this application to please step forward uh, and identify yourself and state your address. Anyone? All right. Close the public hearing. It was fast. It's a feeling of deja vu. <laughs> um, OK, are there uh, other questions or comments for the applicant on the issue of the uh, application? Any further discussion? No? Mr. Chairman? Yes? Uh, Mr. Carter? I think the public should be made aware that we went through this process just a little over a year ago. The same facility in the same place with the same operators. And uh, 
The only change is the number of students, and that's going to be handled by regulations from the state of Maine. If the board doesn't have any objections, I have a motion for approval. I just want to add, we certainly appreciate the attention to the application that the applicants uh, made. Uh, certainly has made this process very smooth. Yeah. I, just to explain that this came before us about a year ago, and the only change being proposed here does not involve any physical changes to the building or the site. Um, and the applicant has done a, a very nice job of addressing all of the issues and more that need to be addressed. So. Uh, our review is, while well, it seems quick, uh, we have looked at all these issues uh, before. So go ahead, Mr. Connor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Motion for approval, findings of fact. One, Laurie Grant is requesting site plan review to expand the Ocean House Child Development Center located at 280 Ocean House Road from 12 to 32 children, which requires review under Section 19-9 Site Plan Review and Section 19-8-8 Daycare Standards. Fact number two, the application substantially complies with Section 19-9 Site Plan Regulations and Section 19-8-8 Daycare Standards. With the Chair, Mr. Yes. Cotter. We're the missing page. It appears, that <laughs> <laughs> it appears that your memo is missing the same page. We all are missing. Uh, my suggestion would be to just... Uh, uh, reuse the motion for completeness and substitute the appropriate language. If you would, you think you could do that? Are there any other findings? That's, that's all the findings. Yes, those are the uh, the only findings of fact. The motion will read: Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Laurie Grant for site plan review to expand the Ocean House Child Development Center located at 280 Ocean House Road from 12 to 32 children. Be approved. Be approved. Be approved. Thank you. Exactly. I just didn't want to do that. I wanted the planners. With a little prompting, the motion has been made and seconded. <laughs> All in favor? Unanimous. <laughs> it's approved. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. And if, if they come back before us, can we put them first on the agenda next? <laughs> oh, that's right. Reasonably on time. All right. Our uh, last item is the <coughs> Hamlin Street Resource Protection Permit request by Joseph Prostacci for a resource protection permit to alter RP2 wetland to construct a driveway to a lot on Hamlin Road. Uh, good evening. Am I up? You're up. Excuse me for just taking a minute to hang. It's upside down, but that's good. Uh, good evening. My name is Stephen Moore, uh, Moore and Sierra Landscape Architects. Here on behalf of Joe Prestacci, son is here with me this evening. What I'd like to do is just take a couple minutes and walk you through the project and the submission information that came in and then turn it over to the board for questions. As we discussed with you at the um, initial workshop and then at the site, Mr. Frustacci has acquired this parcel of land at the end of Hamlin Street, uh, just about 10,000 square feet in area. What I have up in front of you is the existing condition board, which was part of the drawings that was in your um, submission set. As you remember from out there, when you come down Hamlin Street, Hamlin Street is a narrow, 12-foot uh, wide gravel road. There's an existing culvert that takes the upstream watershed, pulls it down into a stream that's shown here in blue. There's an associated wetland that was mapped by uh, Mark Hamlin. There's a low-lying lawn area that extends down from the adjoining house uh, back to the north. And then this hillside that's covered with several oak trees, grading down to some maple trees down in that low area. These are the neighbor's houses on those adjoining pieces of property. 
Um, what we've done is shown that existing stone wall, the slopes, the wetland, and the stream um, as surveyed and mapped by uh, professional land surveyor of Greenlaw. What we proposed to do on this particular project was to uh, come in and construct a house on the upland portion of the site. But in order to do that, what we needed to do was include both your RP2 standards and requirements and those of the main DEP. And just to keep the orientation the same. Uh, as we discussed with you at the workshop and then again um, in the field, the main DEP standards that were amended through September 1st of last year um, contemplate a 75 foot setback from streams um, that is variable down to a 25 foot buffer preserve um, under their Natural Resource Protection Act standards. What we had done was defined the, NA, the 25 foot NRPA buffer shown right in here and then proposed to set the house which you're seeing here in that upland area. What we submitted to you in our documentation was a copy of this site plan with really two hatched areas. There's a rectangle inside which is 38 by 60 which is what we're calling uh, the building area. That's shown by the denser hatching in the plan. By deed restriction, what we're proposing is that that is the area in which all structures must occur. Um, in other words, we can't have any structures outside of that hatched box. There's an overlay of lines that pass through this, which is the area that we're saying, again, by deed restriction, will be the limits of what can be disturbed on the property. What we're saying, then, is that everything from this dark line down, in other words, the 25-foot stream setback and the other side of the property um, cannot be disturbed. We've done that for two reasons. First, it's consistent with what the DEP approved for the site. Uh, secondly, we think it's the right thing to do for the property given the tightness of the property and the sensitivity of that resource. Um, and lastly, we know through our study we've been able to make that building fit and work um, within that area. What we're showing for the full project scope is to widen Hamlin Street and slightly lengthen that culvert. The lengthening of the culvert is needed simply to accommodate the slight widening of um, Hamlin. The reason for widening Hamlin is just to improve vehicular access from the park where um, the gravel shoulders are wide and you really have 14 to 16 feet to get a true 16-foot cross-section of gravel down to the driveway area. Again, the concern is primarily safety and uh, emergency access um, down into that area. That's what really pushes the culvert extension, the slope, and that 12 square feet of wetland impact that are resulting from the project. Um, we would then build the driveway up and in, construct the house on that upland knoll, setting it, as we've shown on the elevations here, um, approximately nine and a half feet above the low-lying area that's adjacent to um, the wetland and the stand of trees down along the stream itself. We are using public water. We'll extend public water in. We're coming out um, to a lift station and then a force main back in, so we have public water, public sewer, and underground electric tied back into the property. Slope graded off in here, but house sitting really right up on that knoll. In the town engineer's comments, he's asked for a swale to be accommodated in this back area. That's not a problem. We can easily pick that up uh, in terms of incorporating a swale into that fill slope. Right now, the, the house comes out. There's a small deck on the back, and there's a little bit of fill coming off. We can modify those grades to incorporate uh, Mr. Harding's comments into that area, as well as his comments about standardizing um, the riprap sizes around that culvert. Uh, last thing to touch on is we have developed uh, a building Joe has provided. Um, this particular building plan, which um, is not dissimilar from the building across the street, 
which is to say that the feature that's shown right here um, is that garage feature, front door and porch. It's two-story um, coming back this way, and then daylight on that back corner. This does, in fact, conform um, with height restrictions, lot coverage, uh, the other requirements of the underlying zone. So we're comfortable that, in fact, we have a building that works and that will fit <coughs> on that particular site and uh, conform to both the restrictions of what we've set out, um, but also be a workable house in terms of sales and what Joe's looking to do on this particular property. We went before the Conservation Commission last week and had a discussion with them about this. Their um, one concern was that, in fact, this line that's shown here be uh, and remain inviolate, that we don't go into that zone in any way, shape, or form in the construction. And the house and its design and layout are, in fact, um, plans so that we don't get equipment below that black, heavy black line, in other words, into that 25-foot zone. So foundation layout access around has been thought through in terms of bobcat access on this side, but then any kind of excavation access on this side because we have um, an 11-foot buffer and edge to that back side. We will be saving a few of the trees, in particular the ones on the north side, a few of the trees right down in the stream and floodplain, and then a couple of trees at the edges, but we will be losing um, the oaks in the center. And you can see that when you go out there and see the stakes that are set up um, for that building window. So that's really the scope of the project. Um, we have our DCP permit in place for the Natural Resource Protection Act activities. Uh, we're here this evening with you to walk through the project, identify any issues or concerns, and then move on as the board uh, chooses. Okay, well again, the first issue we have to address uh, this evening is completeness of the application, so I would ask if any members of the board have questions or comments on that issue. I'd like to make a comment, if I may. Uh, Go ahead. Despite what personal feelings I have about squeezing a house onto this, all we're being asked to look at is a resource protection permit for the driveway and the culvert. <laughs> The rest of it does not fall within site plan review. Is that correct, Maureen? So we're looking at the driveway and the culvert. That's what this board is being asked to, to review. Okay, thank you. I'm not aware of any issues on completeness. Okay. Can I hear a motion? Sure. The motion for the board to consider be in order that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Joseph Rastachi for a resource protection permit to construct a driveway and related culvert improvements for a lot located off Hanlon Street, U29-50, be deemed complete. Second that. Okay, the motion has been moved and seconded. All in favor? Okay. Application is deemed complete. Any other questions for the applicant at this point in time? Mr. Chairman, based on the concerns of residents of the neighborhood when we first visited this site on our first site walk, uh, I would like to see the matter table until our next meeting, at which time we'll hold a public hearing. Now that the final plans have been submitted, the neighborhood can review them and make their comments made known to us. All right. If there's no objections. I'd like to read a motion. Mr. Um, Charles? I'd, I'd also strongly encourage the applicant at the uh, next submission to provide some real specific information that addresses concerns about flooding and water runoff and that sort of thing, particularly for the abutters. Is there something just for some additional direction, is there something missing from the application now that the board feels um, would address? I guess I'd like to see the, the review of your calculations and estimates done in a public forum, which at the next meeting prior to the public hearing would be a perfect time to do that, prior to or after. That's fine. Thank you. Um, my comment concerns your description of the buffer and 
trees that you'll be taking down and trees that you'll be leaving, would it be possible in the next submission to identify further which trees will be staying and which trees will be going? Yes, we can. I think that would be helpful for the people that, that abut that property. Um, any other questions? Barbara? Just two things quickly. You said you were not going to disturb anything in the line below the 25, you know, within 25 feet of the stream. Correct. And then I thought you said that there would be some tree removal there. Now, maybe I misunderstood. I, I may have misspoke, but we, again, inside that 25 feet, there won't be any disturbance, vegetation removal, tree removal. We're simply leaving that 25, we're leaving that band intact as you see it now. That's what I understood the first time, and then I thought I didn't understand it. I have a, just a, a question. I realize this, this stream ends at the end of the lot, but what happens beyond that area just in terms of flooding? Does that stream continue across the next property, or does it end right there? No, this, stream, this stream continues down <clears throat> immediately adjacent to this neighbor's house um, to the east. This continues down, goes into a culvert, crosses under the next street down, then bears off to the south and works its way further down into the town. And you're estimating there will be no more water coming through there than there is today. Correct. Thank you. Um, I understand there was a sidewalk last fall before the winter sets in, but is there any point to my going out there now? <laughs> the stakes that are out there are actually under the snow. If you've been out there, the snow okay. has buried the stakes that identified those points of that inner, inner box. It's even difficult to actually sort of read the terrain because of the drifting that's happening. So I, I take that as a no. Um, if in you, June, maybe. Well, <laughs> I'm thinking if it does warm up a little between now and the next meeting, can we get an, a contact number? So I mean, I don't want to make the whole board go out again because you've all seen it already. But if I want to get out there, uh, I think the chair has to recognize. Yeah. Um, You'll be able to speak, but the chair needs to recognize you. Well. Let me first explain that the board did conduct a site walk at, at the property. We all went out. Um, the new member of the board obviously was not on the board at that particular time. Um, I don't think you can contact the applicant no, I... directly, uh, but perhaps if between now and March 18th, a miracle happens and all the snow melts, <laughs> I'm sure you're free to go uh, at least look at it from, from the street. Um, but, uh, we, you know, we've, we've had the site walk, so sure. we've, we've, seen, we've seen all those issues. Um, yeah, David. Uh, Peter, for your information, a uh, drive-by in the next few days wouldn't wouldn't hurt at all. You okay. get a feel for the property. Okay. I think uh, you would hope to see it when it had, has less snow on it, and you get a better feel for it. Yeah. You know, if, if, if you call me or something, and I've been out on the site walk, and I'd be happy to go again with you. But uh, I'd like to see it again. But I don't think I, I don't see a reason for a formal. That's fine. Walk. Yeah. Um, and. I agree with Mr. Cotter. I think that uh, this item should be tabled to the next meeting, and we will, uh, if the board wishes, hold a public hearing at that point in time where members of the public can come and offer, offer their comments. Um, we, we, can't, we can't do that tonight. Um, so if, it, as is always the case, if you have comments for the board, Please put them in writing, and you have to get them to the town planner. We, we'd be happy to look at them. Okay. Uh, Do we have a motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Be it further ordered that the above application be tabled to the regular March 18, 2003 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing will be held. I'll second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Motion carries. Motion to adjourn.
Second. <laughs> Quickly seconded. All in favor? Aye. We're adjourned.